everybody to our monthly series, the Melman Center Grand Rounds. I'm Shelly Bear, and I'm the Director of Leadership Training Initiatives here at the Melman Center in our training division, and I have the distinct honor of welcoming Dr. Danny Armstrong, our fearless leader and director of the Melman Center, and a million other titles that I'm not going to mention. And he's going to talk about the state of the Melman Center, kind of a year in the review of the past, and then our upcoming year, what to expect. So welcome, Dr. Armstrong. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I can leave now. You've clapped. That's a good thing. Um, welcome to uh, to all of you. I know we've we've got everybody in the in the dark suits and the name tags. So you're interviewing. We're really glad to have you here, and and I hope that this uh, this talk will inspire you uh, and not frighten you away. Um, this is an opportunity to um, to really take stock of where we are with the Mailman Center, uh, some of the things that we've accomplished and, and where we are going. Okay. Is that better? Yeah, it's much yeah. better. Okay, we're, this is our chance to take stock of, of where, where we've been, where we're going, look at some of the things that, uh, that have been accomplished and think a little bit about the things that, that we can do. And, and I'm gonna talk today a little bit in context. Um, if anybody happened to have been visiting Mars, you may have missed the fact that there was an election that was somewhat transformative and that is, um, is having profound and as yet fully under, uh, not clearly understood uh, impact on uh, almost everything um, that we do in our, in our life in this country, but certainly in the area of, of health and health care and children. And so I'll try to put a little bit of perspective on um, meetings that I've had in Washington and Tallahassee and, and Tampa and, and other places recently to uh, at least tell you how much nobody really knows. Our vision that came out of our strategic planning um, piece was improving lives through innovation, impact, and connection. I can't tell you, um, to those of you who have been part of the process and those who are visiting today, I've never really liked going through the process of developing mission statements uh, and vision statements, because what I typically have found is that you spend about six months arguing whether it ought to be an of or a for, um, and, and wordsmithing to the extreme. This is one of the most powerful mission vision statements that I've ever heard, and as I've shared this around the country with other major organizations, they want to know if we've copyrighted it. Um, this statement is something that as I do the talk today, I think you'll see is really governing everything that we're doing here at the Mailman Center. Goal one is to improve lives, and everybody buys into that mission. Goal two is what are we doing that's innovative, Three, what are we doing that is having true impact and how are we doing it in connection with other people? And this, this theme of connections you'll see uh, will run through what I'll talk about today. Our mission statement has been here for 25 or 30 years. Uh, it, it includes the, the catch terms that have been important for the feds that we've embraced, uh, interdisciplinary collaboration, cultural competence, family center perspectives, using integrated mechanisms of research, training, and service to address, develop, and identify, integrate, and educate around development and disabilities. Um, we haven't really changed it, and it, it seems to work okay. One of the things that comes into thinking about a major center, and, and the thing I have to stand up to at the federal level and, uh, and here within the, uh, the university is, well, are you doing okay on what the money? And this is our, our financial impact, and this is gonna be the one place where I'm gonna talk a, a little bit today about specifics of money and, and progress. Um, we are the, the third um, largest funded um, center at the University of Miami, um, with, a, uh, with a, a total impact of about 23, almost $24 million last year. As you can see, what we, what we do need to focus on a little bit in the future is that our federal funding has been dropping. That's not surprising. Federal funding for almost every center out of the NIH has dropped. That, that's not a surprise, but it's a, an issue we need to be able to fix. But one of the things that our investigators have done really well, as you see, that local and foundation funding has really ticked up as a backfill against the, uh, the federal funding losses. So by and large, financially, we're doing okay. And I have great appreciation for uh, our faculty and staff who have continued to work on that. 
our funding sources are all over the place. Um, and I, I just put this up, I won't go through all of them, but in that first column you can see that we, we have funding right now from um, four um, NIH institutes, from HRSA, U.S. Department of Agriculture, Department of Education, and the Agency for Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. So we've got good work there. We have a lot of funding from the state of Florida, um, m most of it from the Florida Department of Health but from uh, other organizations and our involvement with uh, children in the legal system um, through Child Protection Team and through the Dependency Court, the Attorney General's Office, uh, all are positives. Um, locally, a lot of funding from the Children's Trust, the Early Learning Coalition, Miami-Dade County, um, and then we've been very successful in having foundations um, really buy into the things that we're doing uh, with um, a number of grants funded this last year from. Um, from some new programs, um, uh, the, um, the Baxter International Foundation is a relatively new uh, one to us. Uh, the Applebaum Foundation has been providing us funding for almost 15 years. The big thing we've done, and for those of you who are visiting with us today, um, we've shared this, uh, this, this structural change. Um, uh, just last week at, at a national meeting in Washington, but also over the phone, as we've shared it with other centers for disability. One of the directors told me they, they pulled it out and shared it with their staff, and um, the main thing they had to do was, was call 911 because there were three MIs on their staff when they thought about doing this at their place. This structure um, is, is a structural reorganization that came out of a three-year strategic planning process that involved the input of uh, faculty and staff across the Mailman Center. Uh, we really shifted from identities uh, and functions as, as separate disciplines to um, what we call interdisciplinary uh, or interprofessional collaboratives um, in five different areas, and we'll talk about those a little bit more, with the idea that Certain components, training, research, clinical service, and community engagement were things that would cut across um, all of the, um, uh, the IPCs, as we call them. And it, it has been a little bumpy. Um, it, it was a little bumpy at times uh, as we really thought about doing things and structuring things in different ways. But I, I have to do a real um, strong thank you to our, uh, our staff and faculty for taking on something that truly, as much as I can tell, is innovative and is having impact. Um, and it's doing a lot of things with connections, and that's probably the one thing that our IPC model has done um, as much to accomplish in this first full year of implementation than anything. It has, it has brought people who never knew other folks in the center or other folks outside the Department of Pediatrics and introduced them to one another, not only so that we shake hands and say hello, but has created new uh, working relationships that are substantive. So from the, from the structural model, the function seems to be really following um, and, and off to a great start. And I, I just uh, express great um, appreciation to everyone who's, who's helped with that. Um, th these were some of the reports. Uh, I'm just gonna highlight some of the things that came out of the different uh, IPCs, our community wellness group, um, has really been uh, engaged a lot in, um, in health, um, particularly around obesity and, uh, and uh, nutrition and activity. Uh, Sarah Messiah's Fit to Play program has been expanded with the county um, in the uh, intellectual developmental disability population. Um, and we really are seeing great community collaborations coming out of, of the program. They are um, looking now at form of collaboration with the Women, Infant, and Children uh, Health Program, uh, working on a, a response to an NIH uh, program announcement, um, really supporting uh, graduate student programs in perinatal health, and one of our programs really starting to move into the world of, of big data uh, analysis and, and research. The Lifespan IPC um, was, it has really taken on a, um, a, a huge challenge, and the challenge being that our children with uh, special needs and developmental disabilities grow up and being able to support um, them across their lifespan uh, is a critical issue and we've, we've seen some um, bringing, uh, Dr. Friedman in particular has, has helped to bring together a number of folks that were not typically part of the Mailman Center from other chronic illness um, uh, 
groups. Um, and one of those is, is a project that's come out with the CHAMP Literacy, Literacy Skills uh, Enrichment Program that involved Dr. Shandar from our nephrology program, not a, a common kind of connection uh, around neurodevelopmental disabilities, but we have many of those that, uh, that the group has, has brought together really nicely. The engagement of Dr. Matt M. Uh, from our MedPeds program in the Department of Medicine has also been a significant um, approach to how do we actually do this process of providing care across the lifespan. Um, and Matt is working with that and also with uh, Florida Hats um, in some collaborative projects. And we are, the, the, the uh, lifespan group is just clearly uh, reaching out and bringing in new excitement um, from sickle cell, from HIV, from nephrology, cardiology, and the like. Um, We've, we are seeing uh, a, a survey study that will be presented, I think, uh, next month uh, that will come out of this. There are expansion of transition initiatives to include parents in the, in the planning of that um, and, uh, and then a transitioning board concept for training and, and service models that is really innovative and unique. And so the, the, this is one of those places where in a year a, a great deal has really been accomplished. Our Promoting Positive Behavior IPC um, has been really f focusing on behavioral health in a, in a very big way. Um, one of the things that they did here um, this last year that was really impactful, we've developed a relationship with the community of East Little Havana, primarily um, Hispanic um, low-income community here in the Miami-Dade area. And um, uh, Jason Jan and the group were able to bring, I think, over 50 providers from the area to a meeting here to talk about how to collaborate, integrate, not uh, duplicate services to improve care uh, for children in, in that area. There's, uh, they've developed a training innovation and, tra uh, and trauma innovation team to approach new uh, initiative issues. Um, they put on a very nice mailman in innovations and impact conference um, last month um, and are working with the Linda Ray Center and the Dep Dependency Court on expanding the Parent-Child Interaction Therapy, or PCIT program. Um, they've submitted five grants out of that IPC and one has been awarded, and they're, they're really focusing on the expansion of this work with East Little Havana. Um, we started off with an IPC called Neurodevelopment, and pretty soon it became top-heavy, and so we split it into two, so we now have one, uh, the Neurodevelopmental Discovery IPC, um, with Bob Pfeiffer and, and Dan Messenger as the co-investigators, and this one is really pulling in scientists across the university to look at basic and translational um, and uh, clinical science uh, related to neurodevelopment. We have three priority areas that have come out of this IPC so far. One um, flew into our area um, this last uh, summer uh, on the backs of some mosquitoes carrying the Zika virus. Uh, and we became ground zero in the United States for Zika. And out of that, the university, um, I think, submitted 27 grants to the state of Florida uh, a week or so ago on Zika research. And I think there were about nine of those that involved faculty and, and staff from the Mailman Center. And we've got a really nice relationship developing with um, faculty in the Oto, uh, Department of Otolaryngology around hearing issues. and. Um, with the Department of Psychology at Coral Gables um, and the Genetics Department uh, in the autism area. And so there, we are looking at, uh, at, at a variety of, of development of integrative team science work and this group is really just, we just split them off uh, a few months ago so they're early in their work. But we've already um, made connections I think with 12 or 13 scientists and I've met someone uh, a couple of weeks ago that will be uh, joining our autism team um, that I never expected to see. It was a, a faculty member in the Department of Biology who is doing autism research with zebrafish. Um, and so we're, we're learning that um, our center is, is really expansive. The other, uh, the fifth one, uh, IPC, is the Neurodevelopmental Intervention uh, Science IPC. And, this one came about because we really need to look at what were those, those things that were going on that we could improve in terms of early intervention. Um, vocabulary increases, uh, looking at alternative communication. We have a huge early intervention program, uh, actually we have several, 
um, that serve uh, more than 5,000, or at least identify more than 5,000 children a year. And being able to use that as a database for learning about long development, about the effects of trauma, and so the work has been uh, been going on there. And, and we've actually now worked out a, a program within the university where every patient that comes into our system um, will be provided an opportunity to give consent for a later follow-up for uh, research study. So this will be a, a component of building a, a very nice research database. Um, the the uh, Neurodevelopmental Intervention uh, Science Program is really nicely involved with two of our major programs, the Early Steps Program and the um, Debbie School, with efforts going on in community-based training to improve evidence-based literacy, uh, increased collaboration of grant applications, integration of records, and um, and a major effort on a National Science Foundation grant uh, application that's being planned. So when I look at what those, those IPCs have done after we reorganize and got everybody to talk to each other, what we see is folks who are really starting to think out of the box. So I see a lot of opportunities uh, and examples of, of innovation. Um, the things that are being planned here, the work with our, our community partners, um, work in high topics like Zika and, and autism. Um, these are things that are high impact. They, they are, the work will make a difference. And what you see throughout this, I, I wish I had this, the computer skills to be able to draw one of those cool maps where, you know, who's working with who and where do all the lines go. But what I look at already is those maps would be pretty dense with the cross lines. So the connections are really working well. And I, I just applaud all of you for that. Across those IPC initiatives, we've had a number of things that have been going on. Lisa Gwen has been leading us on our, our telehealth initiative, um, and we've spent a good deal of money this year to set up several telehealth suites and, and getting those uh, uh, operational. Telehealth will be um, one of those outreach access things for us to be able to provide direct services uh, to children uh, where they live using the technology but it's also a really important way of being able to expand our outreach in terms of education to professionals and community members um, and to continue the work that we've been doing using the telehealth and the video conferencing capacity to help build capacity in other countries. Um, we have uh, our relationships with, uh, with Paraguay, we have a relationship, uh, of course, in, in Haiti, the Dominican Republic, We've got work that's going on in Brazil, and we've had contacts with uh, Abu Dhabi. And so there are, uh, and, and I shouldn't forget Thailand. So we, we have a number of countries that are working with us, and this provides the way for um, telehealth to essentially condense time and distance in ways that we've never been able to do before. Um, uh, Dr. Delamater has started back up our, our research brown bag and mentoring program in research and is, is supporting that across the areas and that brings a, a breath of fresh air to, to folks who really were operating in a silo and on their own and we're looking forward to the growth of, of that program even more. Uh, Jean Hershorn has been really working on the uh, reorganizing of our clinical space and clinical flow to make it easier for patients to come here and for us to be able to provide services in, that, in, a, in a much more effective and efficient manner, and, and that's going to continue. Uh, we spent a lot of money on, um, on a renovation, and we're gonna be continuing to do that. We have an endowment that can only be used for that. It's not as much as we need all at once, but we're spending it all each year. Um, for those of you sitting in this auditorium, this is pretty nice. Um, a year and a half ago, the carpet was tattered, the, um, the drapes were a dark velvet blue with holes in them. Um, most of the seats tilted and shifted. You couldn't hear me in the back because the sound system didn't work and we never knew what the temperature was going to be. So we've made some progress right here. <laughs> and if you look at other conference rooms where folks come in, we've, we've made some really significant work there. We've gotten essentially all the carpet out of the building and replacing it with really nice vinyl. And what you're going to be seeing this next year, um, which is important for us, the, the lobby of the mailman and the lobby of the Debbie, we're going to retile those areas and, and so that when people walk in, it looks really good and the tile will be non-slip. Um, it's really kind of crazy to me that 40 years ago, uh, we put in glazed ceramic tiles in an area that came in from a 
from a place where it rains a lot in the summertime with children who, you know, just not like adults, they, they are simply not careful. Um, and so uh, we'll be really improving the safety, but also the appearance and the interest of the center. Uh, Jeff uh, Brosco and, and Nancy Torres have done a phenomenal job um, setting up a highly innovative navigator program. Um, we are uh, for families, and it's one of the first navigator programs for families of developmental disabilities that we know of in the country. Um, and there are learning materials and contacts, and that program is expanding. Um, and I think it's going to be a premier um, uh, hallmark of the Mailman Center over the next several years. But in principle of what we try to do so many times, I hope that we do not keep it just at the Mailman Center. It becomes something that's replicated um, and expanded uh, across the country. Um, our work with, uh, and Shelley, particularly in the Emergency Transformational Leadership Program, we have been able to bring professionals from the community who come in and spend a year with us working together on a significant leadership program related to um, a project related to uh, individuals with developmental disabilities. And, and the outcome of that is that we are now sending people back into the community who have gotten many of the principles and values that we have of, of uh, caring for individuals with developmental disabilities. But, uh, most importantly, they're going out and they're actually implementing some of these programs. So this last year's class was working on the development of an app that a person with a disability in a wheelchair could access to know where an elevator was closed. If you got off at a metro rail station, what was the safest way to go? Um, who, who had the, the best Uber? Um, so there's, there's some work that we, that's the kind of project, high impact projects have been coming out of the ETLP. And similarly, we noticed a a while ago that um, there's a lot of work in self-advocacy. Individuals with developmental disability who become self-advocates and the focus had always been on helping those individuals to express themselves and what we saw was that individuals with developmental disabilities do a pretty good job of expressing themselves but the effectiveness of the things that they want to change didn't really always come out and so our uh, SALT program, the Self-Advocate Leadership Program, it's really focused on helping helping uh, develop leaders in the area of effective self-advocacy. And this is a new program that's really taking off. But we're working with the other state developmental disability programs to be able to use this as part of a pipeline in leadership development for uh, the state of Florida in uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. And then importantly, we're in the second year of funding um, from the, um, uh, the Agency for Community Living for a disability fellowship. Um, we, we actually, I'll slip it out, we had the highest score each application cycle um, for our fellow um, who is working on uh, our, a big part of our initiative, the interaction between, or the intersection between disability and, um, um, and health disparities but is also working on integration with the university's um, Office of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs to ensure that disability is included in our cultural um, diversity statements and practices. So I, I wanted to take a step right now to, to, to pause for just a minute and I'm gonna put some of our, our faculty and staff uh, on, the, um, on the hot seat by asking a question. And Jason, since you were down, uh, interrupting my coffee this morning you get to be first would, can you comment on one thing that you have seen out of this process that you would say really represents the innovation um, that we were trying to accomplish uh, I mean I think that you've said this in Uh, within communities where uh, we're within 
Doug Lane, I'm going to put you uh, on, on this. The, wh what's the biggest impact you've seen? The biggest impact that I've seen is probably the connections that we're making, especially that we serve similar populations but in different ways. But the ICC is actually bring us together so that we can discuss what each of us are doing, um, collaborate um, towards projects that we'd like to implement, as well as consider research opportunities that we'd like to build an evidence base for what it is that we're actually doing. Kathy, what about connections? What, what have you seen changing in the connections area? picked on three people they were not plants um, but I, I did want to I did want to make the point that this is not just the director telling you a nice clean version these are the real the real kinds of things that we've accomplished and this this talk today in this meeting is really an opportunity for us to take stock after a year to say you know when you're in the weeds sometimes it doesn't feel like you're moving as fast as you are but when you step up and you look at the fact that the weeds have been sort of blown away um, it's, it's a really good thing. Now let me move on to the next part of the talk. For those of you who were here last year, you've seen these slides. And I, what I decided to do today was, last year I laid out a whole a series of challenges that we faced. And I deliberately went through a, a, a green, yellow, red uh, font to, to really talk about in the last year, where have we seen changes? What things have shifted and, and where are we? And one of, the, one of the challenges that I mentioned last year was the issue of, of developmental disability services for children with uh, special health care needs. And genetics was a, was a big issue. Um, we had a loss last year in the state where we had had some funding of $100,000 for the genetics programs and, and the governor vetoed that and it went down to zero. Um, but we do have newborn screening pa panels in place for more than 30 conditions, and there is a push to expand this to include acute leukodystrophy in the next, uh, um, next legislative session. What we have been able to do through advocacy with other groups is that the Department of Health uh, has included in its legislative budget request for this upcoming session an increase in funding of 200 to $200,000 for each of the state's genetic centers. In addition to that, another 900,000 to help to support the expansion of laboratory services. We made a decision here at the Mailman Center to allocate um, some of our endowment funds to assist um, uh, Jackson and the Department of Medical Genetics to be able to sustain and grow um, the uh, biochemical genetics uh, program lab. Um, that was essential to being able to pick those children up and get them uh, appropriate care. And that is now going to be assumed by um, uh, the Jackson Health System with a, a vibrant and surviving lab. So I, I would put us into a, a green area there that has been uh, moved forward. There's still a lot of work. We are still having a major shortage in the area of genetic counselors and, and it's really sort of strange. The national priority is precision medicine and the use of genetic information to inform care. And the one thing we don't have are people who are trained to actually apply that clinical knowledge. And so we'll be looking at that. Oral health remains a, a huge problem, um, uh, especially for children with uh, developmental disabilities. But we were able to add uh, Dr. Dina Barone, uh, who had been part of the mailman faculty and gone back into practice for a number of years, who came back this year, and Dina has uh, has helped us with uh, an affiliation with the Nova Dental Clinic in, in Fort Lauderdale, and so we, we've reestablished our craniofacial uh, clinic. So while I would say adding Dina is a green, we're still um, in the red on oral health, but moving in the right direction it remains one of our priorities. The, the second component that we had is, is uh, the whole idea of prevention. We talk about it, but we don't always go about doing it. 
One of the things that we know has been a major problem in this country um, has been uh, disparities in mortality before one year of life, and that has been particularly true in uh, children who are of African American heritage. And that was particularly true in some of our African American communities here in Miami Dade. Um, uh, Connie Morrow, Elena Mansour, um, and, and others have undertaken the HRSA funded Jasmine program. And I would put that into yellow. Uh, they're working in um, the Miami Gardens area, um, or maybe not Miami Gardens, maybe one of our major communities. I, I, I get our communities mixed up sometime in my head. Uh, but they're working on a, a strong intervention program with, with mothers of newborn African-American infants. And the goal is to increase the number of children who live past the first 365 days of life. It's an innovative program, and we've just connected them to the state surgeon general who is making this a state initiative um, in Florida. We've still got a long way. I'd like to say that Walter and the child uh, protection team were going out of business. Um, we're not there yet, um, and we've still got a lot of work, but, but the CPT has become really involved with this process, and one of the goals that I, I really hope to see is bringing in, uh, bringing in some investigators who can really help us to understand the, the outcomes of trauma and help us to develop some uh, additional prevention programs in collaboration with other community pieces. Extreme poverty remains an issue. Um, we don't have a fix for that at the Mailman Center. Um, we, we kind of struggle to figure out how to, how to pay everybody some, some months, so we can't fix poverty yet. Uh, but it is a, an area of interest, and I'll talk a little bit about it in terms of election things in a few minutes. Uh, domestic violence, um, uh, we've actually seen some improvements in domestic violence statistics in the state of Florida, but not in certain pockets, so we still have work. We've got great developing work with the juvenile justice system and the dependency court, and the, the numbers that keep coming out is that somewhere around 60% of youth who are involved with the juvenile justice system have a developmental disability that was either never diagnosed or inadequately provided treatment. There's a phenomenal opportunity for us to identify those children who have these disabilities and get them the appropriate care. That's a prevention strategy for uh, involvement with the court system, and, and I really hope that we do that. And then our whole work in uh, in inadequate or inappropriate services and in early in identification and intervention is the community effort. We've made some real progress. Our early steps programs, Debbie School, are ideal, but that excellence doesn't necessarily move to the community, and that's a big part of what we're going to be trying to do. Um, probably the biggest nas unaddressed national uh, crisis in health is behavioral health. Um, it is, uh, is out there, and I put these numbers up last year. Um, more than 12 million children have a diagnosable um, behavioral emotional health condition. Uh, there are less than 4,000 behavioral health mental health professionals with specific in training in um, child behavioral emotional health in the U.S., um, which means there's a caseload of about 3,000 per provider, which is not conceivable. Uh, and that doesn't include children with um, uh, with conditions that don't quite rise to the level of diagnosis but are still disturbing. And so one of our real challenges um, that uh, the uh, um, Promoting Positive Behavior IPC has been working on is are there innovative ways that we can think about triaging and utilizing technology to, to provide uh, services to a large group that is a simple education component? Are there ways to be able to, to triage folks who need additional assistance and then create um, more intensive uh, opportunities for training uh, and support for those with the most severe conditions. So the, um, um, the, the Promoting Positive Behavior, IPC, has been working very nicely um, to, to think about using uh, ways to use telehealth and web-based services to see if PCIT can be moved into the community in a, in a broader and more effective way. So I, I put this as a, is a, a, a little bit of yellow and a lot of red. Our developmental disability services continue to be an issue. We've had shortages in a lot of areas, particularly um, speech and language pathology for bilingual uh, children. 
Uh, we've been able to this last year hire uh, some bilingual speech pathologists and, and we'll be working uh, to uh, continue growth in that area. Um, we've developed a, a new pilot physical therapy program of hemophilia at the Bachelor uh, Children's Research Institute uh, with the Department of Physical Therapy and, and uh, have, have brought faculty from, from physical therapy into the Mailman Center um, in, in a really meaningful way, both in terms of clinical and uh, research activity. And we've got a great collaboration going with the Department of uh, Otolaryngology and the Barton G Center in audiology, speech, and just this last week we agreed to co-recruit a um, social worker who will help with that program. And so we, we really moved along. Ophthalmology has always been, we have the, the best eye institute in the world, but not great integration um, here at our center and certainly not out of here with pediatric ophthalmology, but Zika has brought um, investigators from Bascom Palmer and the Department of Ophthalmology together in collaboration, and, and we really hope to be able to build on that. So we've got some, some yellow to green going on there. Nutrition continues to be uh, an issue, and we really haven't done a lot of work in this area. Some of our partners uh, at NOVA have developed a, a, an interdisciplinary feeding program, and, and we've been trying to uh, at least emotionally support their efforts to, uh, to expand that. But we've got a lot of work uh, to do in the, in the area of nutrition and uh, exercise physiology. Um, so I would put that one as a, as a red. Our work in continuity of care across the lifespan, I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, Matt M and the MedPeds program and our um, lifespan IPC have been doing really great work to, to thoughtfully think about how do we train MedPeds residents to be coordinators of transitional care, what kinds of information will be needed for um, internal medicine specialists uh, who provide care to these individuals. Um, there, a lot of this is education. Some of it is um, setting up programs and transitions, figuring out how to take model programs here um, at the university through the Mailman Center and put it out into communities that don't have a major academic medical center will be a challenge. So we're very much in the red on that. And you really don't want to be an adult with a developmental disability and have a significant healthcare crisis in most communities because the hospitals are not prepared. Um, the nurses may not be able to um, even know how to communicate with you. Augmentative communication devices may not be there. Misunderstanding of conditions like autism may not be there. Um, stigma related to a person with a severe disability who has seizures may be pervasive. And so we've got a lot of work to deal with about how to improve acute care for um, not as much for children, we do a really good job with that, but for the adults uh, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Resource challenges. Every one of the IPC says we don't have enough time, we don't have enough money to do all the things that we do, and I agree. And if anybody thinks they've got enough money, please raise your hand and let me know. And all of you who are visiting and you wanna come here, you can write a check on your way out, we'd be happy to take it and cash it quickly. Um, Healthcare support and healthcare funding um, probably has never been at a point of more, with more lack of clarity than it exists right now. Um, we were in the process of moving a, a substances system under the Affordable Care Act to improve methods of health service delivery to increase access, more than 20 million people had, had, uh, uh, had gotten uh, health care coverage under the Affordable Care Act. It had a number of key principles, um, coverage on your parents' policy until age 26, um, no more denial of service because of uh, pre-existing uh, condition, no more lifetime insurance caps. Things that really everybody liked. Unfortunately, what it took was it needed to have full participation. So it was mandatory enrollment because it was only through the involvement of healthy people that they were able to be able to provide the, the kinds of benefits that were necessary all along. As you know, this has been a, um, um, a bone of contention um, for a number of years. Um, and in this process, there were other things. The CMS, um, uh, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Intervention Centers. Um, this were, these were places that actually funded innovative approaches to, to evaluate better ways to deliver healthcare. Um, 
all of these things are now at risk. Um, the uh, designated Secretary of Health and Human Services is the um, uh, member of Congress who most frequently sponsored bills to repeal um, the Affordable Care Act um, up to this point, and he'll be the, resp the person responsible for this. We're going to see some really interesting things come out of the discussions. Um, the, the president-elect says he wants to keep all those things that everybody likes, but nobody's figured out how they're going to pay for them. Um, that will be an interesting discussion in a, um, in a Congress that is now divided um, within the Republican control between fiscal conservatives and social conservatives. And there will be some interesting issues. The, uh, the Democrats in Congress may be in a position to sort of buying tickets and sit back and watch what happens. But out of this is going to come some things that will, will affect us. Um, we're already seeing issues that if affordable care goes away, and we don't have a way to replace it. Some of the things that had been in place as safety nets, millions of, actually billions of dollars, had been flowing from the federal government, from the states, to assure that there were safety net services for people who, um, who didn't have access to care and allowed us to be able to treat in the, in the emergency room, provide inpatient care, and to, and to cover um, true indigent care. With the Affordable Care Act, some of that was shifted, and the, um, uh, the intention was that with the expansion of Medicaid, those kinds of federal subsidies would no longer be needed. So they've been fading out. Um, we're feeling it here. Uh, Jackson, uh, you, may, you may have heard, just had to, uh, uh, had to uh, lay off some middle management folks. It was not because the, the hospital wasn't doing a good job managing themselves. It was because some of those federal funds were cut off. Um, what happens with all of the, the legislature and policy related to the Affordable Care Act is going to have a profound impact. If, if it is repealed, but there's no new federal funding to come in and replace those safety net uh, functions, we could wind up having uh, chaos. Um, most of the people in, in Congress realize that. They, also realize that's a really good way not to be elected again in the future. So there'll be some interesting uh, politics that are going on. But there's some other pieces of the Affordable Care Act that um, are, are also going to be really important. And they're core to the way we've been thinking about things at the Mailman Center. And those were value as opposed to volume. And the, the Affordable Care Act was pushing for payment for medical services and health services based on the outcomes of the patients who were being cared, not how many contacts they happened to have or how many procedures were being done. And those kinds of, uh, of approaches, we don't know how that's going to pay, play out in terms of healthcare financing, but commitment to things like building teams and coordinated care were all things that were being embraced um, philosophically, if not logistically, by a lot of health services. And, and how that will play out in the future is gonna be a challenge for us here at the center as we, as we figure out um, what's going to happen. One of the other things that's likely to happen, most of the children in the state of Florida um, with any kind of significant problem are covered by Medicaid. And there is a plan at this point in the Congress to no longer, uh, to, to essentially do Medicaid by block grants. So a state will get a block of money and the state makes the decisions about how to manage their, their, mani their Medicaid program. Our state has already made the decision that all, mani uh, all Medicaid um, uh, care is, is under managed care. And so how that's going to translate out and the, the policy work that we're going to have to do with the, um, the state legislature and figuring out how those dollars are allocated is going to be our uh, our new challenge um, as we move along. Uh, we, we do have some things about um, uh, oversight of uh, comprehensive wraparound chronic care services. There is a, um, actually a, um, a hearing right now for standing um, for the state uh, pediatric cardiology services to assure oversight um, and, uh, and requirements for uh, designation as comprehensive centers. So we're gonna wind up seeing a lot of more work on that. And our Medicaid waiver wait list for patients with uh, developmental disabilities continues to be um, right up there with history. Um, and we, we can disguise it, but it tends to be somewhere north of 10,000 a year and south of 35. Um, so we've got some work to do there. 
So as I run through those things, I, I, I wanted to do that to say I stood up here a year ago and said these are things we needed to do. And I wanted to point out that there's some green there. Those are the impact things that have come out of the work that you've done um, this last year. There's some yellow there where we've made progress. We've got work to do and there's some red that needs to say on our list. So our principles for what we're doing just want to keep coming back to them. Innovation is doing things differently, leading rather than responding to market and policy change. Impact is making a difference, not only at a child and family level, but at community and population levels. And the connections are doing things together. So our opportunities, one of the things we made the decision to do was to, to make a priority um, goal for the Mailman Center, and that was to address health disparities at the intersection with dis disability. And our, we partnered with two uh, uh, communities in East Little Havana and Overtown, and those initiatives are really underway. And, uh, you know, if I had to sit back and say, you know, how, how good is my crystal ball? What are those initiatives doing? Well, they're working on building capacity of care for children from diverse backgrounds, and there's evidence with, of that happening. They're promoting disability as a diversity and potential disparity issue. That is clearly happening. Um, we haven't started conducting health service research yet, but the, the foundations are, are being done. Um, there, is, there are plans and clearly beginning to work on developing a pipeline of future professionals with both developmental disabilities and disparities training. That's a long-term goal, but I see the, the, the pieces starting to fall into place and clearly the advocacy for public policy to reduce uh, barriers to non-disparate outcomes. Um, I, I actually, uh, some, some of you don't know, but I uh, ran into one of our county commissioners the other day who knew about these projects um, and asked me about them. So from, a, from an impact on the policy level, uh, we're happy. Other opportunities to build uh, service capacity in the uh, communities, and, and we are in, clearly in the yellow of adopting uh, communities as partners uh, and establishing data collection systems. Um, we still got some work to do on the infrastructure building. That's going to take some money, and, and that's my job, is to try to get that money. Um, and we are clearly with our telehealth initiative uh, using technology provide access for information skill training and, and that's going to grow. I anticipate that those three yellows will be green by the time we get here next year. One of the things that you saw as I presented the, the summaries of the accomplishments of the IPCs was this theme of team building research um, and thinking about what are the research questions about the way our service our programs that provide service run. And, and we we're clearly seeing these kinds of things happen. Um, I think we're going to have to do more of each of these areas um, in the coming year to really have the major impact, but it's really nice to see the work um, starting and that theme running through each of the IPCs. Um, we've got opportunities to promote innovative uh, approaches to unmodifiable social determinants of health. Um, we're not yet of, at the point of experimenting with new systems of care, but we are looking at ways to optimize um, scarce professional resources through the telehealth initiatives. We're assisting uh, communities in determining local solutions to increase green space and physical activity. Uh, Sarah Messiah has done a great job partnering with Miami-Dade County on the Fit to Play uh, after school program that is becoming a model for the country. Um, in fact, uh, Michelle Obama had, had been down and had recognized it as a, as a model program. And we are engaging community programs and leaders uh, in, in policy discussions, and we're going to be doing more of that um, in the year to come. Our next steps, there's still some, some work. We're new, um, and there's going to be some clarifying of goals and implementation plans. There's going to be, uh, we, while we've made some progress in improving efficiency and efficacy of our clinical programs, there's work to do there. Um, there's work to do across the University of Miami for core services. Uh, although we've made inroads with child psychiatry and neurology, big inroads with ENT, um, uh, nursing, uh, nutrition not so much, and, and, and the behavioral science component is really coming along well. And very interesting, a year and a half ago, if I, I there's a, 
there's a group that I that I work with um, both in my role as, as a dean and um, and as a center director, the, the behavioral science chairs and the center uh, directors. And if I had asked that group a year and a half ago, what do you think the Mailman Center is? They would have said, oh, it's that building over there by the Metro Rail. Well, we've had a number of contacts and some of the major centers of the university now know exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it. And a couple of them, there was a, a commercial a few years ago, I want to be like Mike. Well, some of the other centers want to be like Mailman. And so we have really done a great job of, of getting recognition for the work that you do as a center, not a place, um, uh, across the university. Our next steps are to um, really work on expanding our core uh, services so that they serve as platforms for innovative high yield research. And I describe places where that clearly is happening. Um, we've got to develop a strategic and synergetic, uh, synergistic research plan. Um, that is, that, that's not a one year project, that's a, a multi year project and, and I'm really looking to Alan to, to help to lead us on that task. Um, and then we will be designing and implementing new models of training that we can um, apply outside traditional learning centers. Everything is going to have to change. The way we have trained medical students and residents and psych grad students and nursing students, historically, that's not going to be the way we're going to be doing this in four or five years. And medical school, schools are struggling with it at the LCME level. Residency training programs are struggling with it. We probably won't be training people in disciplinary activities. Um, we're going to be, as, as health systems begin to shift away from departments and into clinical centers of excellence of interdisciplinary care, many of those programs are going to be trying to duplicate what we're accomplishing here at the Mailman Center. So we really are developing a model for the future across multiple disciplines. Um, and then, as I've always said, uh, I want to see this turn green and so that we can give multiple examples where we are intentionally and effectively translating what we are doing here at the Mailman Center into community settings um, as quickly as we possibly can so that um, you don't have to live close to the center to benefit. Bottom lines hasn't changed since last year. The world of developmental disabilities, children with special health care needs and child health in general has changed and will continue to change. Um, the Mailman Center can either be reactive to that change, which we are not doing, or we can be a leader in using this change to improve lives of, family, of the children, their families, and the communities they live in. And I think we've got, in a year, substantive evidence that we're going in the right direction. Final thought is it really is simple. It's as simple as sliding down a sliding board. If we embrace innovation, which we're doing, if we strive for impact, which we're doing, we'll achieve success by being connected rather than isolated. So I want to thank everyone, um, each, each one of the faculty, the staff, our collaborators, our friends, our connections, for embracing this vision with thoughtfulness, commitment, and passion. Um, and I look forward to a green presentation in a year uh, on a lot more items, uh, but not so it's on a slide, because the green means we are making a difference in the lives of people who come to our center and who live in our community and maybe live in communities that are far away. So with that, I'm going to stop and, and say thank you and, and see if there are any questions. And, and all the members of the Mailman Center and uh, affiliates, that applause was for you. Thank you. So any questions or comments?
Well, and, and I, your, your point is actually a really good one, and Walter, it reminded me, we, we were on the street talking the other day, uh, or actually in another meeting, and, and one of the things that we don't put into healthcare that we in Miami have to be incredibly attuned to is environmental change. I and mean, we, we have saltwater intrusion coming into Miami Beach. If you look at any report on climate change and you look at the state of Florida, most of South Dade in 30 years is underwater. I jokingly said the other day the University of Miami may be the first true underwater university. Um, but the impact that that has on disrupting where people live, um, poverty issues, rearranging flow, and ultimately we've talked about the, the, the prime commodity um, being um, energy. In South Florida in 30 years, the prime commodity is gonna be water. Uh, not, not because there's not enough of it, there's just not gonna be enough drinking water. The aquifer that provides drinking water to South Florida runs about 20 feet under the, the surface of the land. And so if we have continued sea rise, we'll have saltwater intrusion, and we'll have a major issue related to accessible drinking water. That's, that's predicted over the next 30 to 40 years. So we have some huge challenges around health, but also thinking about the environment where the families that we care for um, uh, live and, and how we address those issues. Other questions? Or comments, I'm looking more for comments than questions. All right, if not, thank you. Um, and thank you all for the work that you're doing and our visitors, I hope this has been sort of helpful. It would not, didn't teach you how to do a procedure or manage uh, electrolytes, but uh, we, we're really all about the big picture, and, uh, and I, I hope you go away recognizing that we've changed this place dramatically, and it was not easy, but we've done a really fabulous job, and I think we're positioned to serve as a model for how uh, other places will change in the future uh, to have impact, to be innovative, and to do it for, 